morning, church. God is so good. Amen. Good to see you guys here today. A couple weeks ago, we were celebrating our 19-year anniversary, and it is unreal to look and see where God has brought us, see where we started, see where we are, to see what is on the horizon. And one of the things we, we took a minute to do was to remind ourselves why we do what we do. Why do we love God and love people? Or why do we attempt it? And I got to thinking, you know what? What does it look like to love God and love people today in a world that is crying out? A world that is in places on fire. A world that is full of pain and hurting people. As we look on the news and we, and we intercede for our brothers and sisters overseas and, and the, we see the bloodshed and the senseless violence and we bring it down local and we look at our neighbors, we see people who are hurting, people who are struggling. What does it mean to live in a way that honors God so much that we can say we are about loving God and loving people? So today, I thought we'd look at the three basic things here. What does it mean? Let's be practical. How do we love God with our time, with our treasure, with our talents? And thankfully, this church has always been incredible, so generous with your time, with your treasure, your talents. Last week, you showed it again. We had uh, several needs that we made known on those posters over there, and you all filled those up and got a jump on it. And <laughs> some of you were already working on some projects, doing incredible things. I can't believe how much you all got done in a single day. In fact, most of it on this next one is done. This is, this is you guys. You did this. We've got another 100 bags of blue rubberized mulch coming in that we'll put out this week and finish it up. It's incredible. The kids were so excited. Everybody that I know of looks at this and gets so pumped up, so excited. Okay, the big kids get excited, all right? I'll say I was excited. It's actually approved for 250 pounds, so I can be on there. It's all good. I might be a little bit on the age, but uh, I want to look today at looking at using our time and our treasure because you've been great at using your talents. How do we love God and love people? We're going to look at two different stories, and they're both found in Matthew. So we're going to get to that. You can open your, your Bible. I'm going to read from the NLT for the most part today a very central kind of translation between modernized and, and the original, the best we can find. One of the best ways to know whether we are truly following Christ is to look at his example and say, am I willing to do that? Let's just be blunt, right? We look at his example and say, uh, am I willing to do that? Am I willing to live like he lived? You know, let me show you what I mean. Does anyone recognize this amazing lady with her Bible on her lap? Anybody recognize? If you don't, don't feel bad. But this lady is amazing. This is Mrs. Osceola McCarty, and she enjoyed doing one simple thing all her life, and actually now she's legendary. She's famous for it. Miss Osceola earned 50 cents per load doing laundry for the wealthy families of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. But what set her apart was she refused to use modern technology. She didn't use washing machines or any of that. She used an old, what do you call it, washboard, right? right? She used that. So she was in her like 90s, if I, re if I read this story right. And she would just do this for 50 cents a load. And every week she would go to the bank and put just a little bit in her savings account. And when she finally retired, she asked her banker, sir, how much money have I actually saved so far? He pulled up her account and says, Miss Osceola, your little 50 cent deposits are now totaling over $250,000. She was stunned. She couldn't believe it. She said, well, that's more money than I'll ever need. You know, I think since I can't take anything with me in this life, I'm going to bless others. So she went and donated $150,000 to the nearby University of Southern Mississippi to help underprivileged kids be able to attend college for free. And her legacy lives on. The reporters came and asked her why. Here was her response. Why? Because it is more blessed to give than to receive. I know because I've tried it. And they didn't wait long. They already made a memorial to her, put up an incredible uh, bronze monument, and there's a Bible on her lap. You see an empty chair there representing anyone who wants to come up and sit down and hear the good news of the gospel. But it didn't stop there. What happened is the student body started to rally around it, and each year they would come, and they wouldn't even wait for holidays. They would decorate it and put presents and leave all kinds of things for those in need. Her legacy lives on. 
I thought, that's how I want to be. I don't want it to be tied to just me and what, you know, what I can do daily, but what lives on after us? She is such an awesome example of somebody who understands what it means to love God and love others with her treasure. See, loving with our wealth often means doing far more than is required. And it often means giving far more than is expected to where you get those blessings that some of you have seen, you've done it, you've done it at restaurants, you've, you've surprised people anonymously. You guys are amazing at that, wanting to shower people with un credited love. And that's, it has to please the Lord. So Jesus has an encounter with a woman who got this principle. She understood what it meant to give extravagantly. She demonstrated this principle in this powerful way. Look with me, Matthew 26, starting in verse 6. So Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. And while he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and poured it over his head. The disciples were so happy that they saw her honor the Lord that they jumped up and high five. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry, that, 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 that's probably what should have happened. The disciples were indignant when they saw this. What a waste of money, they said. It could have been sold for a high price and given to, oh, we got good motives, right? We, we could have given it to the poor. But Jesus, who was aware of this, replied, why are you criticizing this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You'll always have the poor among you, but you won't always have me. She has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. What? I tell you the truth, wherever the good news is preached, throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Wow. Think about that. Take a moment think about the gift that this woman has just given. In both Mark and John's gospel, they talk about this. And both mention a dollar amount as to what this perfume was worth. It says this alabaster jar was worth 300 denarii. Okay, 300 denarii. Yeah, that's about what I thought that would mean. Okay, let's put it in today's terms. One denarius is basically a day's wage, a full day's pay, okay? So 300 full day's pay. That's almost a year's salary. And she comes in with it. All right, so you guys got to get that. This is not some cheapo perfume I bought at Five Below, okay? Ladies, this isn't uh, Baby Soft or, or uh, Wild Musk, you know? And men, for, for you guys, this isn't um, Dracar <laughs> or Cool Water or Eternity for Men or even Night Panther. This is one of the most precious things she owned. It was probably the most expensive thing she ever held. And what'd she do with it? She do what most of us do. She put it up on her shelf and say, oh, look how exciting this is. Look at that. You come in. Yeah, that's, that's a year's salary. That's two Lamborghinis sitting on the shelf right there. Did she take it and put it on down a little, impress the people every day she walked by and say, she smells so good. Mm -mm -mm. That's that fancy perfume night panther. No, she didn't do any of that. She comes in and she breaks it over Jesus' head. Because of that, we can learn something awesome about loving God and loving people with our treasure. The first lesson we see is this. I love God with my treasure when God has first place in my life, flat out. All right, let's start the challenge early today. Honestly ask yourself, don't answer out loud, does Jesus have first place in your life? Okay, start with that. Remember, loving with my wealth is giving much more than what's required giving much more than people expect. No one expected this lady to do such an extravagant thing. Nobody. There's no mention. You know, we see Jesus' disciples actually get kind of miffed about it. They're angry. Like, what are you doing? They said it'd be better if they'd sold it and given it to the poor. But Jesus says, no, she has done a good thing. Besides, you're always going to have the poor. But we know Jesus was only going to be with them for a few more days. So it's like Jesus is saying, guys, you're going to always have the opportunity to help the less fortunate. Always. Count on, it's a broken world. It, and I'm going to come back and remake this, but for now, it is going to be a broken world where you will always have those who are in need. But there are certain times where you will have the opportunity to bless somebody, to love them lavishly, to give ridiculously generously, and to show the one you love honor. And that's what this woman did. I mean, it's obvious. This, 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 Jesus meant the world to her. For her to come and drop two Lamborghinis worth of perfume on him? Didn't ask for anybody. She, wasn't, she didn't have like a second thought. Like, you know what? Let me just scoop a little bit back in the jar. We're good. Dumped it out. Isn't that how it's supposed to be with us when we love God and love people? We're supposed to hold anything back? She didn't. 
I mean, shouldn't we be willing to go above and beyond what's expected or required to God? Think about this example. I mean, we're supposed to be able to say, I'm going to give this extravagant gift to the Lord because I know others don't understand, even though it's not popular, even though it's not even required of me, but simply because I love him with all my heart. That last song we sang is so perfect. What else do I have that's fit for a king? We can give him our worship. We love him with all our heart. This should be our motivation for giving anything. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7 with me. It says, each one of you must decide in your own heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure because God loves a person who gives cheerfully. All right, I'm just going to be, I'm straight up honest. You with me? All right, we need to be able to honestly tell people, look, if you can't give cheerfully, don't give it all. Don't give it all. Why, why, why would you do that? God loves a cheerful gift. If you can't give cheerfully, don't give it all. But I'll tell you this, you need to start working on your heart attitude. A person who complains about giving to God is a person who simply does not understand all God has done and what God continues to do. Because when we see what the Lord has done, it should move us to tears, to compassion. The next lesson we see from this lady, I love God with my treasure when I go above and beyond what's expected. What's expected here? Like when we're new Christians, we tend to kind of focus on the basic core tenets, the basic truths, and, and we look at the, the, the rules and the principles in the Bible, and that is a good thing. But there has to come a point in our Christian maturity, in our growth, where we go beyond the minimum, and we start living at a level of grace. We start living above what the world expects. Let me give you a scriptural example of what I mean. Look at Hebrews 6 with me. It says this. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature. There's that word, mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from sin, evil deeds, placing our faith in God. You don't need any more instruction about baptisms or the laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead or eternal judgment. The writer of Hebrews, don't miss it, he's not minimizing that. He's not saying none of that's important. But he's going on and saying there has to come a point where we move past the basics, where we move from just eating spiritual baby food to steak. Anybody love a good, hot, sizzling steak from the grill? Oh, yeah, yeah especially if the doctor of deliciousness over there gets it off of his grill, Hayden comes, oh, it is on. Mm. Just this past week, I took Milo. We had a little lunch date together. It was awesome. And we go to one of our favorite places, Long Lone Star, Long, Longhorn, Longhorn over Lone Star. Say, I get them all mixed up. It's a steakhouse. I don't have big money. I go there often. So we're sitting there, and the lady comes up to take our order. Milo orders the most expensive steak on the menu. Okay? Yeah. Woo! Glory to God. You didn't pay the bill. <laughs> Settle down. And just like, and not just a little wimpy version, like the, the Mac Daddy, the big filet. You know what I'm talking about? Filet mignon. Like, I'm looking at the price, and there's a lot of digits in that. And my son, if, that, if that's what you want, you know what? I think we got a picture of it. He, so he's so happy. He orders a steak. And then the lady asked the most bizarre question because his answer was all wrong. She said, sir, how would you like this steak cooked? Some of y'all are wrong. How many people like a steak, rare or medium rare? What is up with you? Does anybody like it medium, uh, well done? Anybody? Okay, all right, there's some Christians here. Okay, all right. So we go, and she, he says, I'd like it rare. And I said, oh, what's that? Because I'm going to have to back clean up. He orders it wrong. I said, you can't do that. Said, all right, I'll do medium rare. So she brings it back. It's medium rare. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It was a lot more red in real life. This projector does not do it justice, but I looked, it was still mooing, and it was, it was sitting in front of me, and I said, why didn't you get it like a real Christian, like <laughs> medium well, or at least, at least medium well, maybe well done? He said, because I chew it forever. It tastes like, it's like I'm eating meat gum. <laughs> meat gum? Yeah, no, don't applaud that. That's bad. That is horrible. Even the cook said, sir, if you order it well done again, I'm bringing you a shoe. You can, you can have it. Yeah, we have to move beyond spiritual baby food to steak. However you want your steak, you can be goofy. And the same is true for our time. The same is true for our treasure, for our talents. Maybe you're new to the faith. Maybe you're just starting out. And this is kind of a new concept for you. That's awesome. That is fine. But 
we have to move beyond in our maturity. And we have to get to a level to where we are doing above and beyond the minimums. There's a term that's always tossed around in church, and we don't talk a whole lot about it, but there's a word called the tithe. And it literally translates to tenth means basically 10%. It's a principle that's been taught for thousands of years. It goes to the Old Testament. It actually predates the Old Testament law before it was given. This is where each person or each family is giving a 10% uh, portion of their income back to God. In the early days, this would be a tenth of whatever they made their living from. So if it was livestock, they might give a tenth of the cows or the herd back to, back to the temple. Or, or if it was produce or whatever that provided their income. Now, if you apply that to today's terms, we... Not many of us are paid today in heads of lettuce or chickens or warm goat's milk or any of that. We're paid in dollars, okay? So if you're new to this, the tithe, if you make $100, a tithe to the Lord would be $10, okay? If God gives you gainful employment, a job that, let's say, gives you a paycheck faithfully every two weeks, let's say $2,000, then a tithe of that would simply be $200. Does that make sense? All the new believers that you're listening, if, if you make 10000 a year, your annual tithe would have been around $1,000, 50000 a year, $5,000, on and on. You, get, you give back to the Lord through his local church. It's very simple, it's, it's very doable, and it's a principle that God has given to us to help us remember where our blessings truly come from. It is a principle that we say, you know what? It's not mine to begin with. Right? There's no such thing as Matt's money. It all comes from God. It's his money. It's not, it's not my family. It's really, it's the Lord's family. They're on loan to me. This isn't my church. This is the Lord's church. Does that make sense? Everything we get, do we believe that God provides 100% of everything we have? I mean, if we believe that, then God is saying, I'm going to provide 100% of everything you have. And I'm going to let you keep 90% of it and just ask that you return voluntarily, cheerfully, only 10% back. You can keep the ninth. You can live on that. But out of gratitude to him, we return a tenth. That is where the tithe, the 10% comes from. And I trust, when I first started practicing this principle, it revealed very quickly what my heart was. It reveals very quickly if we're willing to give generously as he has given us or whether we are going to be stingy. We're going to be kind of like uh, Gollum in Lord of the Rings. My precious, right? This is my money, my my gold. Don't even look at it. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. You know, it's like, this is, don't even, it's, this is my precious. And we hoard it. Oh, sorry. Pandemic changed that. We have a new precious. This is, this is your precious now. Or as David said this morning, actually should be a, a can of gasoline, a, a gas tank, right? They, this is my precious. Sometimes I think we think that 10% is extravagant. But is it really? Apply it to your life and in, in, in your, your time and your talent. What if you were to give 10% of your attention and a conversation to your wife? Try that. <laughs> she said, nope. <laughs> She'll know. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm paying attention. I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. I'm giving her 10% of my attention. Let's say I go to the soccer game. I'm watching Hannah. I'm like, hey, Hannah, I'm so excited. Woo, me and your dad are here. We're going to have a great time. Oh, listen, I can only stay for 10% of the game. <laughs> Hope you're cool with that. Don't do anything great in the last part. It's not. It's not that's, that would be the absolute minimum. That's not going above and beyond. And we see what this lady did. I mean, talk about giving everything she had. Remember, our goal, I love God with my treasure when I go above and beyond what's expected. So rather than asking, which many of us do, how little can I give and get by with, shouldn't our heart's motivation say, how extravagant can I be to say thank you? That's what this woman did. Jesus never told her what to do. He never told her to give this much. He never came in and said, hey, I want you to do this and be crazy and lavish. She did it because she wasn't worried about giving the minimum required. And her heart is still being talked about. She went above and beyond. She she said, you know what, I'm going to give so much more than is required of me, so much more than is expected. William Barclay had the most incredible quote. I'll put it up for you. He said this, said, love never calculates. Love never thinks how little it can decently give Love's one desire is to give to the uttermost limits. And when it has given all it has to give, it still thinks the gift too little. We have not even begun to be Christian if we think of giving to Christ and to his church in terms of as little as we respectably can. Wow. Y'all, that is powerful. This isn't a battle we face. 
First thing Milo and I get to do, we love it. We look forward to it. We're a cheerful giver. We return 10% and more into every time. And we never think that. It's not something we wake up and go, I wonder if God provided. And you know what? He's first. Everything else will take care of itself. I want you to know, your staff, your leaders, we practice what we preach. This is no area for hypocrisy. We want our heart to mimic what our speech says. It is so important that we follow Christ's example. Maybe you need to go home tonight, have a conversation with your spouse. Maybe you say, you know what? Maybe God's provided so much. For We're not even doing the minimum. Look at the lady's example. The next lesson she teaches us is this. I love God with my treasure when I live for opportunities to bless God. Wait, pastor, that's wrong. Not bless God. You mean bless others. No, I mean bless God. There is, you ready for your truth grenade? This is so good. In verse 12, Jesus makes a very bizarre statement. And if you're like me, you've probably read it 100 times and it didn't, didn't compute. You're like, oh, that's weird, whatever. And you just kind of go on because you kind of think you know what the story is saying. But in verse 12, he says this, she has poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. Did you catch that? Remember, after Jesus had died, the other women came out right before sunrise, right? With all their spices and all the nard and all this stuff, and they're going to anoint his body for burial. Do you remember what they found? He was gone. He had already risen from the dead. They couldn't do it. Jesus' body had already risen from the dead. But this woman here on this night with this extravagant gift anoints Jesus' body for the death that hasn't even happened yet. Most of them wouldn't even know what, what are you talking about? Think about this, y'all. She alone had the opportunity, the blessing of preparing the body of the Savior. It was hers and hers alone because she seized that moment. She didn't hold back. She could have missed it. And then we wouldn't be talking about her. This is, this is so incredible. She had the opportunity not only to bless God in human form, but then she was blessed by him. This is what happens when we love God and love people with our wealth. We find hidden opportunities to bless God, to bless others. Opportunities we no way could have known about if we decided not to bless. Next, we see I love God with my treasure when I spread the good news to those who need it. When we love God with our wealth, it proves we believe in the mission. Did you know that? We believe the message that God has given to us is for the world, and we are called to reach out to the unchurched in our community. If we do that, it will cost every church financially, period. When we do not love with our wealth, it limits us to what we can accomplish to advancing the kingdom. We can't claim to be concerned about the lost and then not give to reach that lost. That's hypocrisy. The church is the lighthouse. For the church to remain uh, open, to be funded, it has to have that loving God, loving people, those coming around and saying, you know what, I believe in spreading the good news to those who need it. Jesus said this concerning the woman's gift. Keep reading, verse 13. He says, I tell you the truth. Wherever good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. Did you catch that? She, he's saying, long after she's gone, her legacy will live on. Just like Osceola McCarty, the lady we talked about at the very beginning. Notice what Jesus used her gift for. Think about this. He said the story of her extravagant gift would be preached along with the good news, the gospel, throughout the world in her memory. And he was right. 2,000 years later, you're hearing about this woman today. She is the perfect example of what it means to love God and love people with her treasure and the power of an extravagant gift. So let me ask, maybe today is the day we ask the Lord, Lord, what do you require of me? You know what? What do you desire of me? That's a better word. What do you ask? How can I give extravagantly back to you, back to your kingdom? This might mean giving up something. Might mean a sacrifice. Might mean saying no to something so you can say yes to something he's calling you to do. But if it's a sacrifice, then it is an act of worship. And Jesus loved it. He called it good. So not only can we love with our treasure, we can love with our time. And in Matthew 8, Jesus illustrates this. He encounters the untouchable, a leper. Not a leopard, 
a leper. And it is so hard to explain and grasp the hideousness of this disease in this world today. I'll just give you the PG version of what the victim begins to experience. It starts off with lethargy and pain on their body. They don't understand what's happening. And soon discolored patches would start to show up. And then they would start to ulcerate and have nodules that were pink and brown. And they would open and they would admit this foul odor and this discharge. It would be so nasty. And then their voice would actually become hoarse and their breathing would come in wheezing rasps. And not long after that, their head and their face would become so contorted that they were hardly recognizable. That's the first stage. I won't even go into what happens next. Most people, when they found out they were diagnosed with leprosy, only had years, a few short years, to live when this disease ravaged their body. You know what the response was of most people? They honored the Old Testament law. Lepers were supposed to be kept outside the camp. Leviticus 13 tells us, those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing, leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as that disease lasts, they will be ceremonial unclean. Y'all, that means they can't come into town. No more church. They can't go to the temple. They must live in isolation in their place. Isn't that disgusting? That sound, go to your place outside the camp. Lepers were shunned. They were not even allowed to have the right to speak to other human beings normally. They had the crowd unclean, unclean. If the wind was blowing, they couldn't come within like a football field of another living soul. Think about the loneliness. Think about the isolation. Always having to stand at a, at a distance. Y'all check this out. During the Middle Ages, do you know what they did? They brought the leper to the church, whew, and the priest came up, placed a black cloth over them, and gave them burial rites. They treated them as though they were already dead, yet they lived. That's how the world treated lepers. Check out what Jesus handled them like. Look at verse 1, chapter 8. Large crowds followed Jesus as he came down from the mountainside. Suddenly a man with leprosy approached him and knelt before him. Lord, the man said, If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. And the disciples grabbed Jesus and said, he's unclean. You can't get near him. And they ran so far all the way back to Judea because they knew the law. Oh, that's right. Jesus reached out and said, I am willing. Be healed. And instantly, the leprosy disappeared. Lord, if you're willing... You can do this. Can you hear the despair? You hear the anguish in his voice, the cry of of desperation? If Jesus couldn't help him, who could? This was the last stop. He tried everything. There was no cure. If Jesus turned his back on this man, it was hopeless. He would lose hope forever. This was his last chance. Not only was it a cry of desperation, if you look, it's really a cry of faith. He comes up and he says, if you are willing, Jesus, I know you have the ability. But notice that he humbly leaves the decision with Jesus. He says, if you are willing, you can do this. He didn't have any promises to go on. Yet he throws himself on the the mercy of God. And the scripture says, Christ had compassion on him. And I love this. He says, he doesn't just sympathize with him and say, go your way. He does the unthinkable. He does two things that are absolutely essential for every one of us. Even today, for you, for me, two things that are fundamental that we have a desire every one of us need. And the first one is this, the need to feel loved. The need to be touched. The need to have meaningful, loving embrace. The scripture says, Jesus reached out and touched him. No, I can't emphasize enough how you don't do this. You want to catch a disease quick? That's how you do it. He goes up and he touches him. Understand, Christ could have healed him now without touching him. Don't forget that. He did that all the time. He said, go your way, you're healed. Oh, your your, your daughter's over there in another house? She's already, fever's left, it's cool. He did it all the time. Why did he do that? Because our Savior identified with brokenness. He saw the human need, he saw the pain. And he was saying, I am going to give you what you are craving the most, loving touch. Y'all hear the reports about babies who are born in the hospital. We've just seen a beautiful picture of the Eisberg's baby and that beautiful skin-to-skin contact, that loving 
that bonding that just takes place. It is so amazing. It's so beneficial. Not only emotionally, but also physically. In fact, researchers are now discovering all the, the physiological benefits to meaningful touch, like how it increases the hemoglobin in the body, how the tissues receive more oxygen and they regenerate better. Even a simple hug can be so beneficial that it is proven now to lower one's blood pressure. Isn't that cool? I think that's kind of backwards. Because when my wife hugs me, uh, my, my blood pressure goes up. You know what I'm saying? My heart rate goes up. But for whatever, maybe it lowers it. There's a study that UCLA put out that estimates that if married couples were to give one another eight to ten meaningful touches a day, eight to ten. Now, some of you guys, don't, you're reading into this, okay? Eight to ten, don't make this weird. Eight to ten meaningful touches a day that the stats say you could live up to two years longer. That's the benefit. You see the compassion, what Jesus is doing here? He's touching the untouchable, being willing to love and embrace us who are sick and hurting. What about us? Are we? See, when we do this, we're mimicking the Lord's example, and that has to please him. I want us to be known as legit, the real deal, not afraid to love the unlovely. There's not only physical benefits, but Consider the spiritual, the emotional benefits of loving touch. I'm going to put up a picture, and I want you to shout out the name if you recognize who this is. Anybody know who this is? That's right. Not Marilyn Manson. Marilyn Monroe. Famous for her beauty. If you read her history, she grew up in a, a rough, rough background, a broken home. Back then, she was labeled, I hate this title, an illegitimate child. And she bounced around from foster home to foster home, one after the other. And her childhood was no doubt, it was, it was awful. It was rough and probably one that lacked the love that she needed. She didn't have this meaningful touch that, that the Lord can offer. And one day, after she was already famous, she was a movie star, a news reporter came up and asked her this famous question. Miss Monroe, do you ever remember a time growing up that you felt loved? She thought for a minute. She didn't have an answer right away. It stunned, it stunned the press. And then finally, she spoke up and her answer was stunning. She says, yes once once when I was perhaps seven or eight I was with a woman who was putting on her makeup and she had such joy she was in such a good mood and when I walked by her she stopped what she was doing looked at me and very playfully took the rouge puff that she was and she patted my cheeks and we shared just this moment I think in that moment I felt loved Think of that. Here is a woman thinking back to the one instance where she felt loved. It was so meaningful to her that it brought tears to her eyes years later. You all know the story. The rest of her life, Marilyn kept searching for love. She kept searching for that. She struggled. She chased love in so many relationships. Some believe it was probably because she was looking for the love she didn't get as a child. Maybe she didn't get it from the church. All over the world, even in the church today, we have so many people who don't receive the tender affirmations and the love that we need growing up. We have a responsibility as the body of Christ to love God and love people. There's another need, the need to hear words of grace. Oh, this is my favorite part. This is where we'll land the plane this morning, okay? Christ spoke these kind of grace-filled words when he said, I am willing, be healed. Man, you know that leper never forgot this. He never forgot those words that came from Jesus' mouth. And as a pastor, we often come up, uh, across people who have bitter experiences. Many people are struggling. They've, they've fallen deep into sin. And even though they've confessed these sins, they still carry around shame and guilt. Even though they have repented of these sins. Even though we say, hey, as Christ's representative here on earth, the church says, go and sin no more. The scriptures are clear. That is our ambassadors. That's our ambassadorship today. You have that authority. You are invited to share that good news when you repent and believe, your sins can be forgiven. So let me ask you a question. Who are the untouchables in your world today? As our musicians go ahead and come back up, I want to ask you, who is it in your sphere of influence who needs to hear and see and feel God's unconditional love? Because they may not look like the untouchable lepers in this story. Don't be expecting some guy to come up, hey, you know, and his things are falling off. He... In your circle, he may not look like that, but he still needs the love of Christ. 
She may not resemble a leper, but they are in your sphere of influence. Who is it that is untouchable, that needs to hear? It could be a family member. It could be the kids next door. It could be the ones playing on our playground. I just read the most incredible, powerful story of a, of a pastor. His name's Matthew Woodley. And he said, two years ago, he nearly walked away from the pastorate. Here was his honest confession, okay? He said, I started focusing on all the overwhelming negatives of my job. All the stress, all the late night anxiety attacks, knowing I would stand before people in just a matter of hours and teach his word. Years and years of, of disintegrating basement tiles in the parsonage. Years of no raises or a, a pitiful cost of, loving, a cost of living adjustment. And after eight years of frantically meeting need after need and pleasing people and tracking down goofy plant stands for weddings, I could look and only identify only scant elements of spiritual growth in my congregation. And a dangerous ice began to slowly spread throughout my heart. It was the ice of cynicism, an attitude that honestly didn't care if people changed because frankly, they didn't want to anyway. After all, if nobody else cares, why should I? So I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer for escape. Instead, God resurrected the call to love God and love people. God reconfirmed his call to the ministry during a family vacation to Libby, Montana, of all places. Can you imagine that? While he was reading and praying at a nearby park, three children came up to him with bag lunches. They had dirty clothes, dirt-streaked faces, and they plopped themselves down on the grass right beside me. I'm in Libby, Montana. I don't know a soul. And before I could object or move, the oldest child launched into a heartbreaking, complicated story of family dysfunction. The first one spoke up, hi, my name's Deanna, and I'm 12. My sister here is Christy, she's 10, and the chubby kid over there in the Lion King shirt is my little brother, Mikey. He's six. Doesn't he look fat in that shirt? <laughs> oh, I should tell you, our family's a little complicated because we all actually have different dads. My dad is dead. Christy's dad disappeared. And Mikey's dad beats him up. So our mom is divorcing that creep. My mom and her new fiance, Larry, though, hmm, they're over at the casino because she said they needed some time alone. So they bought us all a barbecue burrito from the local gas station right there, and they told us to stay here in the park for the next two hours. Can we please sit with you? He was stunned. As a pastor, he said, I tried to be polite, and I said, uh, sure. And then I asked her, I said, do you live here in the town? She says, no. Deanna answered the first again. She said, we used to live in town over there, but my mom lost her job, so now we live in a tent. Sir, I don't like living in a tent. By the way, what do you do? What's your job? Well, I'm a pastor. After an awkward silence, Deanna, the oldest, looked at him and said, Mr. Pastor, can you please tell me something? I've heard stories about Jesus. I've heard about him walking around and healing people and loving people. Why doesn't he do that anymore? I knew the answer to this one. I had this one ready. I immediately launched into a lecture on the incarnation, how Jesus was here and how he was. And then I caught the eyes of the three children staring at me with big, open eyes love hungry eyes I looked at Deanna and I looked at Christy and then I saw their limp cold burritos and I looked over at little abused Mikey with barbecue sauce smeared all over his Lion King t-shirt and I stopped lecturing with tears welling in my eyes I said let me start over Deanna, Christy, Mikey do you have any idea how much Jesus loves you right now. It was in that moment that God broke my icy heart again. He broke it with his love for these three children. And this is why we love God and love people. Because Jesus did. This is our calling. How you doing with it? If God's challenging you today, know that he's challenging me first. Here's our mission. Here's the challenge. 
I want us to pray. In just a minute, we'll stand, we'll sing a song, the altar will be open. And I want you to ask if God will give you someone with, his, with whom you could be sacrificially involved, someone that you can love, someone who maybe could never repay you. And it might be a family member. It might be a person who has the characteristics of a cactus. You can't even hug them. They're so hard to love. It might be that person that God is bringing, going through a difficult trial. But I want you to pray about that. And then when he lays that on your heart, I want you to follow through. Do it in the name of Christ. Come forward. Love them lavishly. Give generously. And represent our Lord well. Let me pray for you. God, as we enter this time of commitment, your word is spoken. You are here. I pray that in the sanctity of this moment, you would touch our hearts. Who do we need to love? Who do we need to embrace? God, would you put that person on our heart right now? Give us the means and the motivation to follow through, to be like you, to be like the woman in this story. We love you. We pray that you would speak now in Jesus' name.